morning and hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on the first of two informational webinars on the brand new safety improvement project learning collaboratives. My name is Christopher Thrall. I'm the communications officer with the Canadian Patient Safety Institute. I will be your MC for the webinar. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of our webinar's technical hosts, CPSI project coordinators, Jessica Kettles and Alexandru Tichu. Please note this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Safety Improvement Projects webpage. If you're into IT difficulties or if you have any questions for any of our speakers today, please connect with us in the chat box and we would be happy to assist. First, please let me introduce Marianne Darpino, Senior Director, Safety Improvement and Capability Building at the Canadian Patient Safety Institute. Much Christopher. Hi everyone. And uh, again, on behalf of CPI, a big welcome to our information webinar for the launch of our new safety improvement project. We are absolutely thrilled. Uh, we've received an overwhelming response from partners and stakeholders to attend this information webinar. Uh, it really is a testament uh, to our shared mission to improve patient safety collaboratively. We are very excited to share this initiative and engage you in the participation in our safety improvement projects. Um, those of you who I may not have had the pleasure of meeting yet, um, as Christopher mentioned, Marianne Darpino, Senior Director, Safety Improvement and Capability Building. I have the distinct pleasure of uh, leading together with a fabulous and dynamic team of professionals, um, of whom you will hear from in this presentation. Um, and who do the work in, in driving our new strategy, patient safety, right now. Um, just some housekeeping or logistics before we get started. Um, and we are a large group. We ask that you put any questions you may have in the chat box, um, and we'll be monitoring. Um, there is also an email inbox account for each project, so you can certainly send any questions you may have um, to the project leads um, specifically. And so, with, um, next please. Um, so, so, we have the support and expertise from faculty, stakeholders, and partners, including patients and families, with small but mighty team um, of folks you can see on the screen of, of truly passionate uh, health professionals who make it their business each and every day to focus on narrowing that gap and. and um, and, and ensuring patients are safer in our healthcare system. Um, so with that, I will pass it over um, to the next speaker. Thank you. Uh, hey everybody, Carla Williams here. On this webinar, you will be provided with a brief overview of what's involved over this 18-month learning collaborative. You also hear from expert faculty member, Dr. Julia Moore, about the integrated quality improvement most translation approach being used to support these projects. Then, each project lead will provide some additional detail about their improvement project. As you have now, CPSI has launched three new safety improvement projects. These are Chief and Communication, Medicaid and Safety at Care Transitions, and Advanced Recovery Canada. The book here on this slide gives you an indication of how the collaborative is designed. These details are outlined as well in the expression of interest found on our website. The cost to register for a team of four is $5,000, which does include travel, accommodation, breakfast, lunch, and snacks through two in-person events. The fee held on April 30th and May 1st, and the set closing Congress being held in October of 2020. Core team members, that is over the four, are welcome to attend as well, but at an additional cost of $1,250 per person. Communication project will lead to improved patient safety culture and positive patient outcomes. As many know, CPSI has launched a program called Team Steps Canada. We engaged in a pilot with the Health Quality Council of Alberta, who is kept to being a regional training center. Based on learning and strategy to grow and sustain team steps, we will support teams through the Safety Improvement Project in a concentrated effort providing coaching and evaluation. Safety at care transitions will improve medication safety at discharge 
and focus on frail elderly patients with polymorbidity. This team has been working with technical experts in the field to prepare for this learning collaborative, namely the Institute for State Education Practices, a big random partner of CPSI, and as well Dr. Samir Sinha to assess the current needs. The Enhanced Canada Project is based on the international program referred to as ERAS, or Enhanced Recovery After Surgery, and it will focus on improved outcomes and system efficiencies for colorectal surgery patients. The project is supported by a governance group and has close to 30 partners support work from various quality councils, national interdisciplinary groups, circle, and other specialty groups. Through the virtual learning sessions and coaching opportunities, team members will from expert faculty, project participants, and colleagues from across the country. New knowledge and guidance for improvement work in your setting, share experiences and build a network for advancing patient safety in your organization, receive from expert faculty, and of course, where your progress over time, participating in project evaluation and sharing your data with project leaders. So what is your goal? It is patient safety and patient outcomes in your organization using the integrated quality improvement and knowledge translation approach offered through this 18 month collaborative. I'll turn it over to Chris to introduce our next speaker. Thank you so much, Carla. That's actually really fascinating. Cross-functional teams working together with expert faculty. I just, I love the formula here. But let's delve in a little bit more into the actual meat behind the, the information that you're going to be learning. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Julia Moore, who will strengthen the case for QI-KT integration and walk through some of the steps behind the thinking here. Dr. Julia Moore is the Senior Director at the Center Center for Implementation. She supports organizations like CPSI who are spreading and scaling up the use of research evidence in practice by helping them implement in an evidence-based way. She has supported over 75 knowledge translation implementation science projects and has trained hundreds of people in how to apply implementation science. Dr. Liam Moore. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about knowledge translation and implementation science in five minutes. So it's going to be a very high-level overview. But CPSI has been really thoughtful and really strategic in how to embed knowledge translation, implementation science, and quality improvement together to really optimize our results. And we're doing this is because we know that it takes a long time to get research evidence into practice. We'll cite this 17-year gap. So it takes 17 years for research evidence to be used in practice, and even 17 years, not everyone is doing it. And so we really want to narrow the gap. And about this is there's this really interesting paper in The Lancet from 2009 that talks about how 85% of all research dollars are wasted because we never put them into practice in the end. That is equivalent of $170 billion a year globally that we're wasting because research evidence is not being used. So we absolutely must do better than that. So to do that, well, science behind how we can effectively implement programs so that they can be adopted, integrated, and sustained. And so we're using that science of implementation and knowledge translation and merging it with the improvement approaches to really optimize what we're doing and the chance that we will succeed. The key doing that is to really be strategic and not rely on chance. Often when we work on implementation projects, we're doing things because it seems like a good idea or because we have really rough timelines and need to move forward. But instead, we are being very strategic and very thoughtful about how we're informing our implementation based on the science. So it's just what we're implementing that's based on science, but how we're implementing it that is based on science. So we really highlighted five key areas from implementation science that we're embedding in the quality improvement approach. The first is readiness. So making that we understand whether a site is ready to implement, 
kind of leveraging the strengths they have and building on opportunities for improvement. Because we know that if a site is not ready, the chance of success is very low. We're working on building implementation teams and support implementation teams. And that's the whole way that the safety improvement model is being built. Because we know from the research that if you have a strong implementation team, your chance of success and putting research evidence into practice really accelerates that process. There's even research to show that instead of taking 17 years, it might take three years to get research evidence into practice. That, well, we need to understand barriers and facilitators. So we are going to go deep into understanding what it is that people do and don't want to change their behavior. And we're going to pick implementation strategies to directly address the reasons that people are and are not changing. But then hope oh, that people implement things the way they're, that they should be implementing. We want to look at the quality of implementation. So are we really implementing things the way we intend to implement them? Or are we making changes? And changes are normal, but let's make sure we understand what kinds of changes we're making. Those are going to have detrimental effects on the outcomes we're hoping to achieve. I think most importantly, we need to think about sustainability. Canada is known as a country of pilot projects, and we do not want to just be building more pilot projects. We want to be planning for sustainability from the beginning. Two kind of high-level overview slides of some different ways to think about how implementation science can really help um, and it be embedded with quality improvement. I love this formula from the National Implementation Research Network. And it took, the idea here is that to get the significant outcomes we want, we need an evidence-based practice, so that's safety improvement projects, which are based in evidence, implementation strategies that have been shown to be effective to actually change behavior. We need to implement those strategies in context that enables implementation. And you need all of these things in place. If you notice, these are multiplication signs. So if you have a zero for any of them, you're not going to get the same results. So we really need to be thinking about all of these different factors. What I'll talk about is the use of theory. So I think great additions to the way that CPSI is building these safety improvement projects is how we are thinking about behavior change and really thinking about how people, in order to change their behavior, they need to be capable of change, so have the knowledge and skills to change, the opportunity to change, so they need to be in an environment that is supporting change, and they need to be motivated to change. We often spend a lot of time building knowledge and skills, and increasingly we spend time building opportunities. We do not address that motivation problem then people are not going to want to change. And if they don't want to change, our chance of success is much, much lower. We're embedding behavior change theory behind the scenes to really inform how we're going to move this forward. And so we're back over to Tricia. Thank you so much, Julia. I really appreciate your comments on that. I invite anybody to uh, add their questions in for Dr. Moore in the chat box, and we'll address those at the end of the, the webinar. Um, but please, right now, let me pass it over to Tricia Swartz, Senior Program Manager at Canadian Patient Safety Institute and Program Lead for the Teamwork and Communication Safety Improvement Project. Tricia? Thank you, Christopher, and thank you so much, everyone um, who is attending today. My apologies in advance. I do have a cold that I am just getting over, um, but hopefully that will not impact my ability to share my passion for this project with you. As Julia said, um, and I think as her presentation showed, the way we're going about these projects is really special, and we're taking a very different tack with it to ensure success. And now we just want to dive a little bit into the projects themselves and tell you what each of them has to offer. No, is that healthcare teams have changed. No longer are those teams comprised of only doctors and nurses within a hospital setting, but teams now encompass nurses, doctors, allied health, such as physio, occupational therapists, speech pathologists, social work, and unregulated healthcare providers, and that's really just to name a few. 
And the teams are no longer only located in an acute care or hospital setting. They're located throughout the healthcare continuum. So acute or long-term care, primary care and home care. And though our teams have evolved and changed dramatically, as you can see from the screen, we haven't necessarily evolved with our processes and our team training to meet these new and complex needs that they may have. We know from Canadian evidence that 70% of all healthcare incidents are related to failures in teamwork and communication. And we also know from consultation across Canada that communication is a key issue within most care teams. So we really want you to ask yourself today, do you find that your team struggles with communication issues? And this could be anywhere. It could be at the patient bedside, within the care team itself, or doing a process of care. We know too that if you attempt to layer those evidence-based practices onto a team that is having failures in communication, your ability to succeed will be greatly impacted. The issue could be related to lack of communication processes, or perhaps it's even related to interpersonal conflicts within the team. This isn't uncommon. And we've heard from teams across Canada that hierarchy and power authority gradients still play a significant part in team breakdown and communication failure. And we've also heard from teams across Canada examples of pain harm that have been directly related to lack of situational awareness and leadership within the healthcare team. And this isn't always formal leadership. This is informal and formal leadership opportunities. And situational awareness are skills that require development within all team members. And they are often overlooked and not appreciated for their impact on team dynamic and the overall patient safety culture. And again, this can impact your ability to implement so many other projects that you want to bring forward. With all these barriers, and everything you see on the screen here has been taken directly from the literature, with these barriers to team performance, it may seem impossible to fix you. How do you address this? program that we want to bring to you today as one of these safety improvement projects. And it's a program with tools and resources that address all of the pressing needs we just forward. TAPS was originally created by the Department of Defense and the Agency for Health, Quality and Research in the United States. It was done over 30 years of evidence from the aviation, nuclear power, business and healthcare industry. Built in the belief that providing resources and tools to address communication, leadership, digital monitoring and mutual support and improve those skills would ultimately improve patient outcomes. And the evidence that has come forward in the U.S. and in Canada shows that this is true. Team Steps has been so successful that it's been implemented in multiple countries, as you can see here, and I really do need to update my slide because we know of some key countries that have just recently implemented as well. It's been translated in over 10 languages. So we know that it has great uptake. We know that it can be successful. I want to note today that CPSI holds the exclusive licensing agreement with the Department of Defense and the Agency for Health Quality Research to offer Team Steps Canada Master Training here. And we've taken some great steps with some partners to adopt this curriculum to the Canadian healthcare context. I won't go through it, but you can see it on the slides and you can certainly download it later to see what makes us so incredibly unique here. Of the partners that we accomplished this goal with. Um, and certainly, this is not something we did alone. We did this with a lot of feedback to sure that it resonated with a variety of healthcare um, organizations across the country. So, we hope to accomplish this safety improvement project for you. Well, through this opportunity, you will be able to test and implement the Team Steps Canada evidence informed tools and resources to impact local level issues. You will improve quality of care through building stronger teams and improve the patient safety culture within your organization. By using a blended quality improvement and knowledge translation approach that you heard from Julia, you will decrease the risk of initiative fatigue and failure and instead focus on how to overcome barriers to success. If this has been you and your team, if this resonated with you today, you can certainly find more information at the locations on the screen or you can email us after the presentation. Back to you, Christopher. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Tricia. We'll just keep that slide up on the uh, screen for just a minute if you want to jot down. Uh, the core uh, safety improvement project webpage is up there, patientsafetyinstitute.ca slash safety projects, as well as the direct uh, contact with for Tricia Schwartz. The Teamwork and Communication Safety Improvement Project is right for you. If you have any questions, please send them through the chat box and we will definitely address them by the end of the webinar. Uh, 
Next we're going to have uh, Mike Cass, Senior Program Manager at Canadian Patient Safety Institute and Program Lead for the Medication Safety at Transitions of Care Safety Improvement Project. Mike, you're up. Thank you, Chris, and thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, as Chris mentioned, my name is Mike Cass and I'm the Program Manager overseeing our Medication Safety at Transitions Safety Improvement Project. And I keep saying already, well, why medication safety at transitions? We've been talking about this forever. I've heard about this probably since 2005, 2006. And the rationale for this is that medication safety at transitions still creates problems in the healthcare system. Polypharmacy and care at transitions, medication safety at transitions, make up two components of the WHO's global patient safety challenge around medication safety. And it's considered a global issue. So medication safety, the appropriate use of medication, um, being on the right medications are all factors that can lead to significant patient outcomes. They influence length of stay, uh, patient staff satisfaction, and so forth. CPI and ISMP have a long history of partnering together to improve patient safety in regards to medication safety. Some of you may recall some of the work that we did in 2014 with a medication safety summit around this issue. The outputs of that summit were some ideas around empowering and engaging patients differently. And we did this by creating and disseminating a medication safety checklist, which I'll show you in a, in a minute. It's also referred to as the five questions to ask. We thought that at, through some of the work at the time that we needed to really look at medication reconciliation differently and try to make this something that was more user friendly and better understood by patients and families as well. So that the idea of patients and families keeping and maintaining their own medication record could sort of become part of the public consciousness around healthcare. If you're working in medication safety uh, in capacity, you've probably seen this tool. So this is the output, the five questions to ask, created in partnership with ISMP, Patients for Patients Safely Canada, and a few other uh, key groups. This tool has been translated into well over 30 languages and has been adapted and adopted and implemented um, across Canada in various jurisdictions across the world as well. This is not rocket science. We are trying to empower and engage patients so that we have a bridge to a conversation with your clinician, a way of starting that dialogue around what medications have been changed, what medications do I continue, how do I use them? I know if they're working. When do I come back or who do I speak to if I'm having a problem? The idea doing this was that this created a common platform for both patients and providers to focus a conversation around. And because we understood, and to some of Trisha's points, the idea that communication is a huge issue around medication safety. Missions simply nod and take their prescription list and really, you have no idea if they actually know how to take their medications, which ones to stop taking, and so forth. So we're trying to drive that patient involvement, patient engagement, by using processes of co-design and giving them a tool that could be commonly understood at both angles of the healthcare system, the provider angle and the patient angle. Getting back to the idea of medication reconciliation, however, what do we know about this? As we've discussed, we've been working on this for well over 10 years. It's been an accreditation standard forever. We have developed all sorts of resources for this that you may have used. Literature I should say about medication reconciliation. So recent literature published by Dr. Kavitashonia and colleagues in 2013, the Annals of Internal Medicine, this is how medication reconciliation is widely recommended. Anyone working in acute care knows it's also not easily done and not easily done well. Requires a lot of resources, uh, is something that can be very difficult to get buy-in with the staff. And in this article discussed that clearly significant unintended discrepancies aren't they really affect a few patients. And by doing medication reconciliation in a large way, we probably reduce harm. But doing Bundling it with other interventions and other ideas that improve discharge coordination may make an impact. Something else that they uncovered or discussed was the idea that for this interview successful, we really have to leverage pharmacists and not just the hospital pharmacists, but also community pharmacists. And the last point is that most organizations historically have not been able to affect 
effectively identify high-risk patients. Criteria are not consistently applied and have not been used in a way that improved the effect of MedRec. These are the things that we're trying to change through this project. So what did we do differently? Well, we went out and talked to people in the field who are discussing and promoting their good work around medication reconciliation, medication safety, and so forth. And what we found are that there are a variety of different things that different clinical settings are you doing to make this process more effective. One of the organizations we talked to was at Mount Sinai, uh, Dr. Samir Sinha and his group of, onto, of, sorry, of geriatric pharmacist-led medication review and deprescribing. This focuses on social frailty. They have inclusion criteria that you'll see below that you will again if you join our safety improvement project. These criteria that we will also be looking at, the social frailty really put a different spin on medication review and deprescribing. So this is the idea of understanding that patients who don't have close family or friends are at greater risk of readmission and of having an adverse outcome. We've spoken to a few other clinical uh, that are doing very interesting work around medication review and deprescribing. And I won't mention them all here, but we, have, we are very excited about the partners we've been able to get to come speak in our safety improvement project. If you choose to join, we do things around this process to help you identify who the right patients to apply this process to. How do we use the right people for the right patients to do the right things to make this process safer? Some of the work that they did at Mount Sinai that they shared with us involved working with the hospital-based retail pharmacy. They charged the medications in-house in collaboration with the inpatient MD pharmacists. We did work around home visits and med checks with the community pharmacists and adjust the timing of medications so that there was someone in the home when the medications were due for patients who were frail or cognitively or physically impaired. The other thing that they did that really adds a lot of value is working to aggressively deprescribe medications that are no longer indicated. And they've had really phenomenal results in terms of reducing 30 day readmission rates. And I believe these results are still to be published. So this is very exciting work. This is work that you will get to hear about and learn from in our safety improvement project. Also thrilled to share that we will have experts from the Canadian Frailty Network, um, as well as other hospitals and acute care service providers who will be teaching and sharing their, their results and ideas with you. And I don't want to say that the Medication Safety Improvement Project is the best project, but I think you can probably up on that just by what we've said so far. So in the project, your team will have the opportunity Turn from people who are doing very innovative and exciting things to test and implement these ideas in your site and ultimately have the goal of improving medication safety and improve discharge processes for frail patients. You got common quality improvement, knowledge translation, implementation science approach and techniques. If you if you've been sitting there thinking this sounds fantastic, how can I get more information? Please go to our website, download the expression of interest here. Or just reach out to myself, this email or phone number. Happy to answer any questions at any time. And I think it's back to you, Chris. Thanks so much, Mike. Uh, well, I won't necessarily say that it's, it's the best. It is definitely among the top three brand new safety improvement projects that we are launching this year. So kudos to you, Mike. That's Great information. <laughs> and please, by means, jot down the website that you see there for more information, some of the research and stats that are backing uh, all of Mike's claims at patientsafetyinstitute.ca slash safety projects, and reach out to him with any specific questions that you have by email at medsafety at cpsi-icsp.ca, or of course, put your uh, questions in the chat box that you see on the side there, and we'd love to address them at the end of the call. So thank you again, Mike, and uh, we definitely cue you to download the expression of interest form that you'll find at that slash safety projects website, and we'll be supplied in a link uh, in the chat box as well. But next, we're going to turn to Carla Williams, Senior, Project Man Senior Program Manager sorry, at Canadian Patient Safety Institute and Program Lead for the Enhanced Recovery Canada Safety Improvement Project. Carla, it's all for you. Well, thank you to Tricia and Mike sharing about their projects. And here we are now to talk about Enhanced Recovery Canada. So you may be wondering, what is Enhanced Recovery Canada and why this project? Well, the Enhanced Recovery Canada is a project of CPSI 
is rooted in the National Surgical Care Safety Strategy as part of CPSI's Integrated Safety Action Plan. One of within that plan was to identify what were new or emerging best practices in surgical care, surgical care safety, and one identified to develop a plan to disseminate and implement these best practices across the country. So here, as earlier, Enhanced Cover Canada is based on the international ERAS program, which began some 15 years ago in New York. We do know from evidence that implementing these best practices contributes to the outcomes you see it here. So absolutely worthwhile. Also know that although there are pockets of enhanced recovery excellence across the country, there are also gaps. And this is something we're hoping to narrow through this improvement collaborative. While the ERAS International Program has demonstrated some very positive outcomes, it's good to know as well that within Canada, great improvements have been demonstrated as well. And let's just have a look at those. So both services, they did conduct an economic analysis for their enhanced recovery program for colorectal surgery. And they demonstrated reductions, as you can see here, in emergency department visits, GP visits, and a statistically significant reduction in length of stay. What really interests a lot of people is to acknowledge that for every $1 invested in ERAS, bring $3.8 in average in return. So definitely a value add to the healthcare system. Uh, work done at McGill University Health Center, who also conducted an economic analysis of the enhanced recovery program. They were demonstrating uh, reductions in hospitalization stay worse utilization, and lower societal costs. So, and those expectations are listed at the bottom of the slides for if you want to have a closer review. So earlier, Enhanced Recovery Canada is supported by close to 30 partner groups from across the country, many of their logos that you will see here. And when this group came together a little over two years, years ago, there was unanimous agreement that enhanced recovery was the surgical best practice that we needed to propel forward. Initially, we agreed that through Enhanced Recovery Canada and through the work and support from CPSI, we would find those evidence-informed guidelines to create Enhanced Recovery Canada pathway. So we said what we heard was that we wanted to ensure a Canadian lens on these tools and resources. And then developed, we would facilitate dissemination of the pathway and create networks and tools to support implementation of the pathway. What this group determined as well, that for the evidence, Hence Recovery Canada will be built on these six pillars of evidence. And these pillars are supported by the evidence. And the good thing to know that at the root and what you see is patient family engagement. So as we worked with uh, six different working groups to develop the resources that will be used in this improvement project, patients will receive clinical pathways, and pathways will follow the flow of the patient. So they'll start in the preoperative area, flow into intraoperative pathway design, and postoperatively, and discharge. You all receive physician order set templates to help you with your implementation, um, patient engagement resources, and of course, a data collection and measurement guide to support your improvement strategy. So happy to indicate um, our faculty support, some of whom are listed here today. So Dr. Claude Laflem uh, from Sunnybrook Health Sciences, he's the current Enhanced Recovery Canada Chair and our faculty lead. He as well will have implementation faculty, and I call these our local implementation experts. But as you will see, four nurses from across the country, or sorry, I should say one physiotherapist and three nurses from across the country who have actually implemented these best practices in their local setting, and they have rich, rich experience, and they will be on board throughout the whole term of the improvement project and supporting you with your improvement activities, and we're happy to have them on board. Well, we do have the clinical pathway lead for each of these pathways you see here, the six, and they will be available as well to answer any technical or clinical questions you may have through the life of the project. So the RC improvement team do, they say you will test and implement evidence to form change ideas. 
areas specific to colorectal surgery. I will say that the plan for enhanced recovery is that as we have more supportive evidence in addition to colorectal surgery, we will continue to develop uh, pathways for other surgery types, but the project itself will focus on colorectal. And the ultimate goal to enhance recovery after surgery using quality improvement, knowledge translation, and implementation science approaches you've heard about today to implement these change for the patient in the perioperative period. So we would love for you to download the expression of interest and you can find it here on this web link and in the chat box or at any time, please give me a call or an email and I'll be happy to follow up with you if you have some specific questions. Chris? Thank you so much, Carla. And I think you win the award for having the shortest email address for your safety improvement project. That's at erc at cpsi-icsp.ca for any questions on the Enhanced Recovery Canada Safety Improvement Project. You can, of course, get all of the background information and, any de and a lot more detail at patientsafetyinstitute.ca slash safety projects. Thank you very much, Carla. I appreciate your time in uh, explaining some of the ERC ins and outs. Uh, we will move on to the question and answer period. We have had a, a chat box on fire. We may not have time for all of the questions that we receive through the chat box. We invite you to please keep on supplying them because we do take note of them and we can supply those and frequently ask questions pages that come out on the safety improvement project web pages. But right now we'll try and turn to the questions that we have received. Please ask your questions in the chat box or directly email the safety improvement project uh, of interest to you. Um, that I listed it throughout the presentation. We'll make sure we get your questions answered. So right now I'd like to turn to Tricia and ask her from the Teamwork and Communication Safety Improvement Pro Project. Uh, Will the references to research that you indicated through your presentation be available on a slide or available on the web page that you supplied? For example, barriers to team functioning, et cetera. Uh, we can absolutely ensure that those are on our website. Uh, so yes, we, we can make sure that those are available on the Teamwork and Communication Safety Improvement Project website, for sure. Perfect. So probably within a week or so, we, we do have those references and we can be, make sure that they are published so that you do have, have the references there for you before you download, fill out your expression of interest form. I'm going to follow up with you, uh, Tricia, if I can keep you on the line. Um, question from somebody who said that they have already implemented the Team Steps program, the Team Steps Canada program. Uh, we still benefit from participating in the teamwork and communication learning coll that collaborative. Yeah, it's a great question because many people have either participated with Team Steps, the youth content perhaps, or they've taken one of the training sessions that have been offered across Canada. And um, I think that those sessions are incredibly valuable because they give you the tools and the resources and you have those then in your toolbox. I think so amazing about the Safety Improvement Project is that we then give you the support to ensure that you get that uh, implementation you're looking for. So. Only one small portion of the Safety Improvement Project is based on the Team Steps curriculum. A lot of the focus is on the instrument, the implementation, the knowledge translation, the behavior change, the sustainability. Um, and, and so that's what really makes the Safety Improvement Project so special. So I think that if you've already taken the training, certainly don't rule out the Safety Improvement Project. I think that it's another way for us to help you advance your implementation efforts. In fact, it's almost, I'm getting the impression it's almost as though if seen some benefits from the Team Steps Canada program, you would see even greater benefits if you were looking at the Safety Improvement Project, being that it's a longer duration, the expert faculty, et cetera. So would, would, you, would you agree with that? I think that the support, the coaching, the on-site visit, uh, the connection to the Team Steps community uh, nationally and internationally will only further the efforts that you've already put in place. Perfect. Thank you so much, Tricia. Uh, we actually have a question. It, it has been mentioned in the chat box, but we did get a question about um, receiving a copy of slides for the presentation. Uh, they did specify one of the safety improvement projects in particular, but all the slides can be saved after the call when you exit WebEx. You're going to go to File, Save, and Document. 
a day, slides, and a recording of this uh, call will be found on the Safety Improvement homepage within a, a few days. I'm going to say a, a maximum of a week, but uh, gremlins being what they are, we don't know when we'll be able to post this, but it will be as quickly as possible. Uh, I'll turn to Mike, actually, for the Medication Safety at Transitions of Care uh, Safety Improvement Project. Ask, can smaller organizations participate in this safety improvement project? Oh, great, Chris. Yep, absolutely. So we will be hearing from organizations that have successfully implemented some of these practices um, from, from large teaching hospitals, um, major community hospitals to smaller rural hospitals. So we've identified uh, faculty and processes in sort of each of these settings, and we would encourage anyone with an interest to, to reach out. Um, we're going to have something that can fit everybody. I'm sorry, Mike, I think you might just be a little bit away from your uh, microphone there. Can I just get you a little bit closer so we can hear you a little bit better? Sure, that, Chris. That's yeah. Sorry, so just to repeat, absolutely, we are trying to tailor an approach that can be utilized by any size organization. We've identified experts in large hospitals, and we reference those, but we also have a faculty coming to speak and share knowledge from uh, community hospitals, smaller rural hospitals. So there are a variety of clinical experts We've been doing really good work in this area, and we will make the effort to have a process that's inclusive of, of any size organization. Samples and the situations that you're going to be uh, showing throughout the SIP is not going to be exclusively for massive hospital organizations. It can be ported out to a number of different applications. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. And we'll be hearing from smaller organizations who have done really innovative stuff. Um, oh, with fewer resources and different processes than you would have in a larger hospital. Okay. Um, is, is there a reason why you, you chose for this particular safety improvement project to make your target population so specific? If we're talking about frail uh, senior patients at transitions of care, is there a reason why you narrowed it down so closely to that? So because when we, when we reached out and looked for people that were doing things that it did what was described in the literature and sort of looked at resource utilization and what it took to create an effective process. These were the things that we kept sort of coming back to that in order for the process to work, you have to target it towards a vulnerable population and you have to have a good way of identifying that population and uh, utilizing processes that are most efficient. So this was what we've identified through the variety of organizations that we've looked at. They all have very specific ways of identifying um, a vulnerable population and putting specific resources around that. So we knew sure. that a sort of generic process, one size fits all, doesn't work. And we are not sort of prescribing that you must do this exact process, but we're going to be sharing out a variety of things that have been done in this space that organizations can um, adapt, adopt, implement as they and as they see fit based on their local context. Offering these best practices and the reasons behind them so each organization that is enrolled in the safety improvement project can evaluate how it would, could be applied to their own uh, systems. Exactly. It, it, that uh, the narrowness of the target population is, uh, is going to limit the, the, the applicability of these processes. It, exactly. That's exactly it. Perfect. So just out of curiosity, will this safety improvement project focus on one class of medications alone in terms of, say, deprescribing or in terms of uh, care transition management? Uh, first question, Chris? No, we want to leave this open enough for local teams to adopt to their context. So we, again, we will share out processes. We will show what other organizations have done. We will hear from people with expertise and frailty, depriving, and so forth. And we will support Support the team at their level to sort of identify, okay, what applies to us? What do we see most frequently in our setting that we can work on? And they would be free to sort of tailor their approach based on what's relevant to them. Perfect. That sounds terrific. Um, we're going to leave the chat box open just in case we have any follow-up questions that come from our participants. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to get more questions for Tricia, for Mike, uh, as well as for 
Dr. Julia Moore. Uh, but I am going to turn to Carla now and bring her back on stage and ask, uh, in regards to the Enhanced Recovery Canada uh, Safety Improvement pro Project, will priority in the selection of teams, because what we're doing is opening it up for expression of interest forms, and we'll evaluate those expression of interest to determine the best balance of teams for this project. So will the priority be given to sites that have not yet implemented enhanced recovery after surgery? Great question, Chris. Um, and I will say that for the Enhanced Recovery Canada project, we're accepting up to 12 teams. So I would absolutely want to encourage a and every team to apply because you really don't know how that will roll with regards to receipt of applications. So please do not, not send your expression of interest. Uh, but clearly, we will, as part of our selection process, look at current capacities within the different provinces. So we do know, for example, that in some cases, some provinces have uh, current capacity and the needs of that team may be more effectively met through a uh, provincial rollout that's happening. Uh, and that thereafter, our focus will be on those um, teams within provinces or regional areas that have not yet implemented enhanced recovery because goal is to get broad implementation and dissemination across the country and build capacity for sustainability and spread. So we want this to move like a wave across the country. So there will be uh, pockets that we will want to try to focus on depending on the applicants, but please do not apply. Perfect. And I'm sorry, you said that there were 12 teams that would be accepted for the Enhanced Recovery Canada Safety Improvement Pro Project, is that correct? Yes. Fortunate in that, uh, due to the fact that we have four experienced RAS implementation leads able to support this project, uh, we're afforded some greater capacity internally to support the teams. Uh, so with each of those four uh, experienced ERAS leads, it will uh, work with me to support three teams each or up to three teams each, depending on the number of applications, which so gives us a total of 12 teams. That's perfect. Well, thank, thank you. I'm actually just going to open up the same question over to Mike and Tricia. Are we talking 12 teams each for these safety improvement projects? Mike, you, you go ahead. How many teams are you taking on for medication safety? It anticipated maybe 8 to 10, but we, we have an open mind. We have I think formed a hard cap. So if demand was really high, we would look at the, the qualifications of the teams and um, make some sort of co-decisions cool then but offer this as, as broadly as possible, but still be able to have an effective um, process with adequate time for connectivity with the with the participating teams. Absolutely. So so say 12 teams for Enhanced Recovery Canada, say 8 to 10 plus or minus a couple depending on uh, on resources and interest. And Tricia, uh, for a teamwork and communication safety improvement project, how many teams do you anticipate accepting? As the medication safety improvement project, we're capped at eight with 10 being a maximum if, if there's an overwhelming request, which we've heard from many um, teams across Canada, uh, sort of their interest and in, in wanting the support. Um, but based on our number of facilitators and our ability to go in and coach, we really want to cap that at 8 to 10 so that teams have the best experience possible. Absolutely true. Again, with, uh, I believe we had over 700 registrants for these uh, webinars. So I, I anticipate there will be expression of interest forms filled out and sent in uh, by the deadline, which I believe is March 1st. Tricia, can you, can you confirm that for me? March, March 1st deadline for the expression of interest forms that you'll find on our website at patientsafetyinstitute.ca slash safety projects. Uh, I do want to ask Tricia a follow-up question. Do you, if somebody were to come to the Teamwork and Communication Safety Improvement Project without a specific issue, do you invite, do you welcome that team aboard, do, or do they need a specific project or an issue to apply team steps to and to participate in, this, in the SIP, in the Safety Improvement Project? Interesting question. We had, um, we've had interest from a variety of different teams and some who very specifically say we know that we're having a breakdown in communication within a certain clinical process, or other teams that have said we've received back an accreditation type survey on our safety culture and we've heard that there's perhaps conflict or hierarchy issues and we're not certain how to address them. So they don't really know what their problem is. We do ask that teams 
have an understanding of perhaps what their teamwork and communication gap may be. So using some of their data, understanding that they know that this is a broken process somewhere, but they may not know the specifics of it right now. And that's okay. Part of what the safety improvement project does is really help you drill down into that data, understand that behavior change and knowledge translation gap, and look at what tools are the right ones to address the issue you currently have. So it's very customized as we work through the process with you to address the issue at hand. So if you have a concept or an idea, that's great. We welcome you. And certainly you don't have to have a specific initiative or know exactly what the issue is. If you have that, that's great too, but not necessary to apply. Perfect. Thank you much, Trish. I appreciate that. Uh, I was uh, reminded that uh, with a deadline of March 1st, uh, teams will be selected and notified by March 15th. I did want to just reach out as well. Uh, I believe we still have Dr. Julia Moore on the on the call, and I was asked actually from one of the participants if Dr. Moore could ask questions that they were sure that she had for any of the safety improvement project leads while they were doing their presentations, while they were um, presenting their QIKT integration elements to it. Did you have any questions for any of them, Dr. Moore? Um, well, the study been working very closely with the safety improvement leads for um, many months now. So we have had uh, many conversations and uh, workshops and going through the safety improvement projects in detail. I think that for each of the different safety improvement projects, it's been really interesting to see the ways in which we can embed implementation science um, principles to enhance the way they're being implemented and really highlighting different specific pieces. So Trisha talked really explicitly about barriers and facilitators, and so that aligns so nicely with some of the work that we've been doing um, on building out implementation strategies to directly address those, and really getting at, for example, some of those motivational gaps. Um, I think, so I have specific questions, probably because we've spent many, many, many hours together already, uh, but I have been excited to see how nicely these projects can fit with an enhanced QI kind of implementation science approach um, and even really little small changes. The last thing I'm going to say is that we had an excellent call last week with all the safety improvement project leads on motivational interviewing principles and how we can use those to guide some of our work that I think was very, very exciting and might be intriguing to some of the participants as well. Sounds fantastic. I'm, I'm really glad that you are so intrinsic in the planning and delivery of these safety improvement projects because that is one of the elements that we are proudest of as Canadian Patient Safety Institute to put forth in these safety improvement projects, 18-month projects that will delete these QIKT elements to be able to integrate the learning with actual actionable um, deliverables. So, so thank you very much for that, Dr. Moore. I appreciate that. Um, next, I'm just going to turn to Mike and ask him, okay, put you on the stage right now. What is the most important thing to know about that your safety improvement project before applying? Uh, it's the best one? Well, it's in the top three. Okay, <laughs> yes. Very kind of you to say. Uh, so I think the key thing to think about with this is to understand that this isn't medication reconciliation. This improvement safety with a focus uh, or sorry, improving patient safety with a focus on medication safety, but not going to be changing one process. This is going to be implementing sort of bucket or bundle of changes to influence how care is delivered to patients at transition. Keeping that in mind before you download the expression of interest form and keeping in mind when you do make a business case for your team applying for it. And, and maybe I'll open that up to the other two uh, safety improvement project leads. Uh, Carla, what, what is the most important thing to keep in mind before you click that download button for the expression of interest form and make your business case in your organization for sending your team on, on this? Chris, I would say that it's for people to know that these evidence as based best practices can transform surgical care. It has in many countries and many sites. And if you're part of a team that really wants to be uh, involved in improving outcomes for your patients, and I know at the heart of every healthcare provider, that is a longing to say that 
we, I, contributed to something bigger than myself that made care safer or better for my patients with better outcomes. Well, Advanced Recovery Canada has that potential, absolutely. And I can say that uh, our many uh, stakeholders and partners have been working diligently to equip you with some fantastic tools and resources to help you do that. So you're not on your own. Um, you will have huge expertise to help as you go down this road and you can make a difference. That's fantastic. I know deep in it, each one of our, our healthcare providers does have, have that wish. So, um, Tricia, I'll turn the floor over to you and ask you, what should someone know before they click and download that expression of interest form and, and submit an application for the Teamwork and Communication Safety Improvement Project? I think that, um, first and foremost, teamwork and communication is fundamental to everything we do in healthcare. And we know that these tools and resources within the program that we're going to offer will just make your team stronger and uh, build your patient safety culture to improve your patient, resident, client outcomes. And so um, this really speaks to all uh, healthcare organizations across the continuum. It's for clinical and non-clinical staff. It's interprofessional. Um, so it really is open to everyone. Don't feel as if your issue is too large or too small to be addressed with these um, resources and these tools. And similar to what Carla said, it isn't just equipping you with the toolbox and getting those into your hand. It's really about being able to hold your hand and bring you through the implementation process to shorten that uptake gap that Julia talked about and really ensure that your implementation is successful and that it's sustainable. It's not just another project. It's not something else to lay on top for yourself staff. This isn't the flavor of the month. This truly is building something into your culture and creating that sustainability. Yeah, absolutely. And we do have the resource, research and the resources and the, and the deliverables to prove that. So thank you so much for that, Tricia. Um, I see that we're at time now, so I'm going to ask that anybody else who had any questions that were left unaddressed, please email uh, safetyimprovementprojects at cpsi-icsp.ca or the individual safety improvement project leads that you had during the course of the, of the slides. There were also instructions on the chat box as to how to download all the slides for your own information or for your business case so that you can follow up uh, afterwards as well. We do want to respectfully thank Dr. Julia Moore for sharing her time and her expertise. Thanks to Mary Ann for joining us and, of course, to our three project leads for introducing these exciting new learning collaboratives. Thanks, of course, to all of you for taking the time to attend. We know how busy your day is and we appreciate you choosing to spend time with Canadian Patient Safety Institute. Please our website for a recorded version of the presentation, which should be available within the next week. And remember, if you didn't get your questions answered, to please send them by email. I invite you to visit our website at patientsafetyinstitute.ca slash safety projects to find out more about the three new safety improvement projects and load the expression of interest forms for the project that suits you best. Please tell colleagues about the next informational webinar that will be held one week from today, February 12th at Eastern, which will cover the same material we addressed today. So have a wonderful day, everyone, and hope to see you again soon. Take care.